Welcome to session four, our final session of the parent guide to helping your child change their substance use. Today's topic is helping with actions and we'll be discussing the importance of using positive reinforcement to promote positive change in your child, when to allow natural consequences to occur, and when to enforce consequences for unwanted behavior. The presentation will last approximately 45 minutes and we'll have about 10 minutes left at the end to answer any questions that you have. We will give you frequent reminders throughout the presentation to, en to enter questions into the Q&A box on your screen. Smart Choices is our adolescent substance use program at CCP, and we believe in supporting both adolescents and parents. We understand that parents are uniquely qualified to help their child change their substance use. The Parent Series supports our overall goal of preventing the life lifelong consequences of childhood and adolescent substance use. We'll be using the term parents throughout today's presentation. Uh, please know that everyone that is attending is welcome to be here, whether you're in a traditional caregiver role or non-traditional role. We're happy that you came here to the series today. We hope to provide you with some new tools for the often complex problem of substance use, including how to gain perspective on why your child is using, how to take care of yourself throughout the process, how to talk to your child so that you are more likely to be heard, and today's topic, how to react when your child is using and not using. And we can't stress enough the importance of practicing the skills that we're going over in this series. Just like any skill in your life, it takes some time and practice to become comfortable with it. My name is Shannon Myers and I am a registered nurse board certified in psychiatric mental health nursing and I'm the Smart Choices nurse coordinator. I have a background working with people with co-occurring disorders, so that's substance use and a mental health condition, and I have training in, fa in family recovery, which is something that I became interested in after helping my own loved one with substance use. Uh, Callan Weiser has been part of the series, but she won't be um, available for this evening, but she is our care coordinator for the Smart Choices program and has a background in crisis management and family-based services. And Dr. Abigail Schlesinger is our Smart Choices medical director, and she has been a huge part of putting this series together. And Colleen Gianeski is also on the line. She is the program director for Smart Choices, and she has helped put the series together and is running all the technical things behind the scenes tonight. So as I mentioned, this is our final session, so we don't have any more sessions after this one, uh, but our previous sessions went over the topics of helping with understanding, self-care, and words, and tonight we'll be helping with actions. The information throughout the series comes from the Center for Motivation and Change Parent 20-Minute Guide, and we will have more information at the end of the program about picking up that guide. And there is a website, Center for Motivation and Change.com, that you can check out for some other things like parent blogs and videos. And the book Beyond Addiction expands upon the topics from the Parent 20-Minute Guide. So when thinking about ways to help your child with actions, it's important to remember that substance use is only part of the equation or part of what's going on with them. There's other factors that you want to consider as well, such as the group of friends that they hang out with or their emotional development. And that's why it's so important not to take a one size fits all approach when trying to help your child. I'll be reviewing some basic problem solving skills and you can use these skills with any problem, including substance use. And it's important to remember to work through problems thoroughly and systematically and take time to learn what would be useful for you to implement and take credit for the things that you're already doing well. So the first step in solving a problem is defining the problem as narrowly as possible, trying to keep it clear and simple, and trying to also focus on one single problem. If you focus on many problems at once, it can be pretty overwhelming. And sometimes people often see what they identify as the problem um, as being one thing, but it, sometimes it's a bunch of smaller problems lumped together. So um, if you are defining the problem and you're seeing multiple different 
um, issues in there, you might want to tease out those smaller things so you can tackle them separately. And that will also help you feel more accomplished and optimistic once you're able to um, reach those smaller goals. And then the second step is brainstorming possible solutions to the problem. So really writing down as many solutions that you can think of, and that will help foster a sense of possibility and also gives you some choice about what you could possibly do. And you want to write your list without being judgmental towards yourself for coming up with certain ideas and not rule anything out until you have thought of any possible solution that can help. And so that really requires you to resist your inner critic that wants you to dismiss ideas out of habit or fear. And some options could be viable, even though um, they may seem unrealistic at first. If you give them a chance, they might actually be useful. And then you want to eliminate any unwanted ideas. So after your list is finished, you want to review all of the ideas and examine them closely and then take out the options that you can't imagine doing. Uh, maybe because there's too many downsides to those or because they seem too unrealistic. Even and then if you cross off everything from your list, then you want to go back to step two and brainstorm again. Uh, but hopefully you have at least one potential solution uh, for the goal that you can focus on and you want to choose the one that's most doable. So something that you could see yourself doing in the near future, maybe even within the next week or few or a few weeks and then um, try to also keep it positive. So focus on what you will do and not on the things that you won't do and try to keep it simple and measurable and involve skills that you are either currently learning or that you already know. And you also want to keep in mind that it needs to be something within your control, otherwise it might not be achievable. And we talk about these steps a lot throughout the series, so it's um, identifying possible obstacles and then addressing those obstacles. And we mentioned those a lot because it's really important to do these things throughout the whole process. So you want to figure out what issues could get in the way of your goal and be specific and it could be specific or pre predictable obstacles that you know will probably encounter or it could just be a general awareness of some challenges that could arise from the situation. And then you want to address each obstacle being as specific as possible with how you'll do that and list all the obstacles and how you'll get past them. And you want to avoid using vague uh, statements like I'll just deal with it. You really want to focus on being specific and these two steps really help build your emotional resilience since you will already know the emotional hits that might that you might receive and then already have a plan on how you will bounce back from those. And then the last part of the seven steps is seeing how things go. So this happens after you've carried out your plan and you want to then evaluate how that plan went, which allows you to see what worked and what didn't work. Um, and also did, did your strategies work well, or maybe there was an obstacle that came up that you weren't uh, prepared for and thinking about what that was and how to work through it the next time. And that gives you opportunity to change things for the next time. So this is really a learning process. So it's important not to skip this step uh, because it's part of the process of improvement. And it's really important to collaborate with whoever you're co-parenting your child with, whether it be a spouse um, or someone else in your life. And during the last session, we talked about how communication breaks down when your child is using substances. And we focused on uh, communication between the parent and the child, but communication between parents can also break down too. So it's um, important to remember the skills that we talked about uh, last week as well. And parents sometimes will get defensive when they're talking because they might have different ideas about how to address a particular problem and they might be defending their position that they think is correct or um, also being easily angered when your stress is a common response when you feel like you're out of you don't have control of a situation and it's common to have that feeling that you're at wit's end with the other parent and it's common that misalignment happens when your child's using sub substances. It can happen under even the best of circumstances, so it's not uncommon for this to happen. And being on the same page um, or not being on the same page can make it uh, more difficult to deal 
with an issue and the more serious an issue is the more polarizing it can be so also another reason that this can be common it's important to focus on finding a way to collaborate together in order to help your child so when collaborating it's important to remember that all the adults involved in your child's life give clear directions and consistent consequences both for positive and negative things and make sure to present a unified message and um, that will help not leave any room for doubt for what's expected from your child and remember that change will take time it is a process and it's difficult we talked about how um, difficult it was in all the sessions i think so thinking about changes in your life and how difficult those will be will help you remember that and, and have empathy for your child through the situation and also making your expectations clear is important the more ambivalent your child is about a change the more important it is that you're clear uh, different expectations, whether they're in explicit or implied between the two parents, will send mixed messages to, to your child. And collaborating has a lot of benefits. It can help you, it can help increase happiness in the relationship with your co-parent and de decrease the stress you're experiencing. And can also help with a, having a positive attitude towards other people in your life, um, especially your co-parent and your child. And um, agreeing with the co-parent doesn't mean that you have the same views as them. Um, it, and teens do understand that people disagree on things and that's OK. But knowing what you agree on with your co-parent and what you don't agree on and then what the rules will be going forward for your child is what's important. Uh, you can acknowledge differences and still align your expectations. So saying something to your child like your father and I have a somewhat different feeling about this, but we've decided it's Im important for you to be home by 10 would show that you have uh, a misalignment maybe about the exact circumstance, but you're still in agreement of what's expected. So there is a collaboration worksheet in the 20 minute guide and this encourages you to brainstorm ways that you could improve communication and collaboration with your partner or co-parent and you want to make one goal for the week and consider the pros and cons of each so in this example for collaboration they are going to find 10 full minutes a day to talk about plans for the next day the pros being that they'll be less likely to get their wires crossed about who is doing what but the cons being that they feel so busy that the co-parent gets mad when they say that they need to talk. And then the communication idea is practicing active listening three times in the week by asking the co-parent how their day was and listening for three full minutes. The pro being that the co-parent will feel appreciated and um, the con being that at that time of the night uh, they, they feel frantic and they might not be able to do it which then would make them feel like maybe they failed at this goal and then step two is doing the same thing for how to reduce tension between you and your co-parent and trying out one of those for the week so for this example they're going to agree to try one of the co-parents ideas for a consequence for the child when they come home late and the pro is that the co-parent will feel less defensive, but the con is that they think that the ideas, some of the ideas the co-parent has are too harsh. And then step three is once you've selected all of your goals for the week, list the obstacles that come to mind. So again, another important thing that we do all the time, thinking about those obstacles and then how to address them. So for this example, the co-parent works late every night that week. And so they're going to address it by asking the co-parent to wake up 20 minutes early so they can talk at the beginning of the day. So I want to encourage you to enter any questions you have into the Q&A box and Colleen is going to look at that as I continue into the next section. So it's common for, pa for parents to hear that confrontation and punishment and detaching are the best strategies to use with substance use, but actually they don't promote change. And in fact, they are likely to push your child into the opposite direction of change. Um, this is because it can increase your child's defensiveness and they feel like they might have to defend their position 
or um, detaching really leaves no options for connecting and making possible change. And if your child is feeling like they're only receiving negative attention from you, um, it might be ang you might be angry about maybe the last incident of use or worrying about the next time they'll use. So even if they are maybe sober when you're talking about them, your attention still might be focused on use because of those issues that you still have going on with your anger or your worry about it. And negative feelings are understandable to have as a parent, but they prevent you from seeing the good things that are also happening. So simply stated, reinforcement is rewarding your child for doing something you want them to do again. And we're going back to the some of the concepts from the first session, helping with understanding. And so we know that um, there is a reason behind your child's use and they're getting some sort of reward out of it. But that same behavioral mechanism that keeps your child using is the same one that you can tap into to get them repeating positive behaviors. So specifically acknowledging and rewarding the behaviors that you want to see them continue. And this is what helps your child see the value in repeating that behavior again. As a parent, you have to figure out what's rewarding to your child, uh, which can take some time and a lot of creativity. And you might have to try many things before you find out what's the right thing that's rewarding to them. And you also have to um, deal with some of the discomfort that might have by rewarding behavior that you feel like your child should already be doing. So you may be wondering um, how all of this actually um, leads to change. And so what we're doing is we're creating competition between the wanted behaviors and the unwanted behaviors. And the key in that is really um, finding something that helps your child feel good and um, creating that competition and allowing your child to have opportunities to experience that other thing that makes them feel good. So feeling proud about having good grades or acknowledging them because they clean their room or recognizing their efforts to get home um, in time for their curfew. All of these things are positive and will help them feel good for, for doing them when you do acknowledge them and prov provide that positive reinforcement. And in increased positive reinforcement leads to improved self-esteem because they're feeling better about themselves for doing these things. And um, that will help them have those same feelings of feeling good without having to use substances in order to feel that way. So rewarding your child when they're not using is important to help increase change. And it's important to keep things in mind when you're trying to figure out what those rewards would be. So remember that the reward is in the eye of the beholder. Um, and if you aren't sure what your child would find rewarding, you can simply ask them what kind of things they like. And then you also want to make sure the reward fits your child's needs in whatever life stage they're in currently. And that remember that that can change over time as your child gets older. Also following um, the behavior closely, you want to do the reward um, immediately or shortly after if possible. Um, that way they connect that behavior with the reward, but you never want to give the, the reward before the behavior occurs. And then you want to also pick things that you're willing and able to give. So you don't want to pick um, a reward that's not compatible with your values or your budget. Um, and some of the most effective rewards are free. So your attention, your compliments, and your affection can all be used as rewards. So you might be wondering if this positive reinforcement I'm talking about is some form of bribery. And I think that's a valid question to ask. Um, and I want to go back to that concept of the competition between the wanted and the unwanted behaviors. And that's really what we need to start our child um, experiencing that competition between them. So what we're doing with the positive reinforcement for the wanted behaviors is we're getting that competition started. And then over time, the behaviors become rewarding within themselves. Uh, but sometimes they need a nudge from the from parents to, in order to get those behaviors started so that they can start experiencing the benefits of the behaviors. So this is a reinforcement worksheet from the 20 minute guide. And step one is listing the behaviors that you're hoping to see change. 
and then identifying specific alternative healthy behaviors that you want to support and choosing one behavior from the list that you're going to reward that week. So the behavior to change could be coming home um, late from school and being stoned or high or getting up late and making the morning stressful for everyone. And then the alternate behaviors could be coming home on time and sober and getting up on time in the morning. And then step two is brainstorming possible rewards for that healthy behavior that you're hoping to see and make sure that some of the rewards that you're uh, brainstorming are free rewards. So some free re rewards you could give is complimenting your child on their effort to come home on time or letting them play video games for 30 minutes before doing their homework. Or um, if for rewards that do cost some money, maybe a $5 gift card to download some apps on their phone, if that's something that they like doing. Um, and if they come home maybe five days in a row on time, driving them to hang out with their friends on the weekend. Okay, so again, I wanna encourage you to enter any questions you have into the Q&A box, and we will continue to monitor, th monitor that. And I will go ahead on to the next section. So I want you to think back to a simpler time uh, when your child was much younger. And for anyone that attended session one, you might remember this family of ducks that we showed. Um, and this is, it's, it's kind of a cute comic, but it's saying that um, when you were, when your child was younger and you let them take a nap, it felt really good as a parent because you were able to maybe get some peace and quiet for a few hours or maybe get some things done that you needed to do. But then the consequence as a parent that you suffered was having your child energized and up at night and wanting to play. And so you may have then thought, you know, why, why did I let them nap so long? Um, so that was a consequence then, but now when your child is a teen, consequences can be a lot more complicated. And it's stressful uh, for anyone, especially a parent, when you feel like maybe nothing that you have been doing for consequences has been working. So we really want to um, share with you that a combination of your consequences as a parent, the natural consequences that your child experiences from the world around them and positive reinforcement from you is more powerful than any one strategy alone that you could possibly use. And this is hard. Uh, we talked about this a few times, how you're not born knowing these things and um, that's okay. But as a parent, you can learn these things and the more you practice them, the easier they'll become over time. So we talked about natural consequences in our first session, but for anyone that wasn't there or for a refresher for people, uh, natural consequences are the direct negative outcomes for your child's behavior. So these are the ones that are external. They're not things that you're doing as a parent um, because of the behavior. These are things that they're experiencing in the world and in their life. And your job as a parent is to allow the negative outcomes and the from their decisions to be felt and heard. And we talked a lot about how that's really hard as a parent to allow that to happen. And um, figuring out what negative consequences that you're comfortable with as a parent is really important. We all have different um, lines and stance, stances on you know, what we're okay with and what we can, can and can't tolerate. And knowing in advance where you stand and how you feel is really important. And then also remembering that every parent's different. So you don't have to feel the same way another parent feels that you know, um, really just keeping true to yourself and what is okay with you. And I think this uh, picture highlights um, natural consequences pretty well in pretty simple terms. So um, it shows this girl and she's wondering where her bike is and she had left it outside and it got stolen. So the natural consequence of leaving the bike outside is that it was stolen. And a, lo a logical co consequence or a consequence imposed by a parent would be your child walks through the house with their muddy shoes and they were told not to have their muddy shoes on in the house and then the parent makes the child clean up the mud on the floor. So that's the difference between natural consequences and consequences from parents. So there is an exercise in the parent guide about not natural consequences. So step one is uh, finding 
or um, asking yourself what are the potential or actual natural consequences of your child's use and also focusing on what the safe to allow consequences are. So the ones that you're comfortable with as a parent. So for this example, um, staying up late, maybe because they were out partying the night before and then sleeping in and missing their soccer practice. And then step two is identifying anything as a parent that you're doing to buffer the experience of those consequences. So whether you're doing it inadvertently or purpose purposely um, or not, what are you doing to soften that? So in this example, um, this parent is waking their child up and then driving fast so that they don't miss practice. And then step three would be what you can do as a parent to let your child experience the natural consequence more directly without putting them at too much risk. So for this, um, letting the child miss their practice and bringing them to talk to the coach after practice. That way they have the full experience of not being able to attend practice and having to explain to their coach why they missed. And I'd like you to enter any questions you have. Please continue to put them in and we'll address them all uh, shortly after the next section. So I mentioned your consequences as a parent, and so these are the things that you um, need or want to do as a parent um, because of negative unwanted behavior that your child participates in. And so key elements of providing consequences is being clear about them and also being consistent. And you also want to make sure that the consequence fits the unwanted behavior. So in the 20 minute guide, they say don't use your biggest hammer first. So an example of that is if your child starts using for the first time, not kicking them out of the house after that first time. Um, if you do that and you use your biggest hammer first, then you won't know if the smaller if smaller consequences coupled with positive reinforcement would have worked or not. And so you also want to leave room for your child to be able to improve. Um, also not threatening consequences if you don't plan on implementing them. That's a really important one. Anything that you say will be a consequence, you do want to follow through with that if that behavior occurs. So um, being clear with um, your consequences that you're going to implement as a parent requires some pre-work on your part. Uh, you need to figure out ahead of time what each consequence will be and um, also thinking of meaningful consequences for the behavior. And it's very important to let your child know beforehand what the consequences will be. Uh, that really puts the choice in their hands as far as the behavior. Um, if they know what the consequence will be, um, then they can choose what they want to do and experience whatever consequence it is, and it really makes them accountable for their behavior. You also want to keep in mind that the consequence should match the behavior, again, as we stated before, and you also want it to be something that's possible and practical to enforce. And consistency is the other key to your consequences. So being um, united in your front, even if you and your co-parent feel somewhat differently about things, really presenting it to your child um, that you're united about these decisions and having a discussion prior to agree on what consequences you'll implement um, and helping each other enforce them. So for example, if you take driving privileges away from your child because of a behavior they did, uh, working out in advance how your child would get to school or activities is important. And um, also being consistent um, helps you with your credibility. Um, so we talked about not threatening consequences that you are not willing to enforce. And then also helps with you as a parent feeling in more control of the situation and what's happening and also helps increase your child's motivation to make some of those changes. So there's a, um, your consequences worksheet in the 20 minute guide and step one is listing your expectations for your child's behavior and describing the consequence for going against the expectation. So the expectation is they will come home on time from the party and the consequence will be if they are more than 15 minutes late, they will not be allowed to use the car the following weekend. And then step two 
um, choosing from the items that you came up with in the first step, planning on how you'll communicate the expectation and the consequences to your child and use the, your new communication skills. So the things we talked about in our last session. So for example, saying something like, I know it's hard to leave your friends, but you need to be home by curfew. If you are more than 15 minutes late, you will not be able to use the car next weekend. I'm happy to send you a text reminder if that will help. And then step three, anticipating any obstacles that might get in the way and then thinking about how you can deal with those obstacles. So for example, um, this parent might be working and they may need to get the, their child to the soccer game. So making sure that the co-parent can drive the child to the soccer game. And so some things to remember uh, from the, this presentation specifically are um, trying to identify the problems that need your attention and then working on them thoroughly and systematically. So using some of those problem solving um, skills and tips that we went over at the very beginning and then collaborating with your co-parent is really key to being clear and consistent as far as the consequences that you're going to deliver and positive reinforcement so acknowledging or rewarding the behaviors that you want to see your child continue that is what is going to lead to the positive change and like we um, like i mentioned a few slides ago that really the combination of the positive reinforcement from you as the parent for the wanted behaviors the natural consequences that your child experiences from um, other places in in their life and the outside world and um, that is more powerful than any one strategy that you could use. And really remember to practice everything, not just from this session, but the other sessions as well, and give yourself time to learn these things and be kind to yourself during the whole process because this is tough stuff that you're taking on. Um, so you want to be easy on yourself um, that you're trying to do all these things and accomplish these things with your child. So we want to thank you for attending um, this session and any of the sessions that you attended and you will be receiving an email from our smart choices team and we'll have information about how you can pick up your copy of the parent 20 minute guide at your child ccp practice and we'll, we will also include copies of all the powerpoint presentations from every session and instructions on how you can access videos from all, all of the sessions and also a link to a brief survey about the sessions. We would really appreciate your feedback so that we can make improvements in the future. And please contact us at WPATips at chp.edu if you are interested in any support as a parent or if your adolescent is um, interested in support through the Smart Choices program. And so now we will take a look at the questions we got. So Shannon and Colleen, we do not have any questions currently in the box, so I did send a reminder if anyone has any questions that Shannon and I are more than happy to answer any of those, even if they um, have to do with one of our previous presentations, we're happy to expand on any of those topics. Um, I'm also going to let everyone know that if they want to stay on even after the live event, Shannon and I are going to be available and stay on a little bit longer. So if you um, if you want to think about some questions and send them after the live event, we'll um, we'll both be available to continue to answer those for um, for a little bit longer. And if anyone doesn't have questions, I would invite you all to really take some time to think about one behavior um, that you'd like to start thinking about um, that you'd like to reinforce um, positively with your child as well as coming up with some potential consequences um, that you could enforce if they um, are not able to meet those expectations because I know as a parent myself it is challenging to um, make those decisions in the moment especially when emotions are high so taking some time to slow down when you removed from the situation and you are um, calm and you can think through things uh, will really pay off whenever you are faced with a potential um, challenge with your teen in the future. So it looks like we may have one question here. Um, someone had mentioned that during last session some comments were made about the need for sudden action or words. Say for example the teen walks out when they are grounded. 
So I think I'm understanding the question correctly, but whoever asked this, if I'm not, please um, correct me. But it sounds like um, we had someone give an example of um, the situation with their child seeming very um, urgent and needing to do things very quickly in order to help them. And so we talked about trying to slow down and go out of the emergency panic mode to really have some discussion with their child and use some of those um, techniques from the last session, like the open-ended questions and the reflections and summaries um, to try to find out more and find out how you can help. So I think that the question may have been around that. Um, and so for that, I think just really um, trying your best to um, even though it's really hard to to slow down in that and then really use some of these skills that we've been talking about over the last few sessions. And Shannon, the, uh, the, the person who expanded it as a follow up, for example, if they refuse to comply to a previously discussed punishment. Um, and I think that is that is something that is very challenging. And one of the things to think about is if you choose a, a punishment, really thinking about those barriers is are you able to as a parent enforce that consequence um, and so that may help with um, with what you're talking about is so if you say that you are going to remove the phone and the teenager says physically will not hand the phone over to you what uh, what other ways might you be able to limit their access to that phone, whether that is a parental control um, or whether that is to deactivate temporarily the phone. So, you know, we've got to really think through those consequences. And if I give that consequence and I label that as a consequence to a certain behavior, what is my ability as a parent to follow through with that? And if if we find that it's going to be challenging to do that, we may really need to think of a consequence that we are able to um, impose without having physical um, aggression, like trying to take the phone away physically. Um, if that's not safe, then that's not something that we should be doing. So we need to be thinking about other ways that we can impose a consequence. Looks like there might be um, another question, Shannon. What emotions are high slowing? Uh, when emotions are high, slowing down can be impossible. Um, and and I, I absolutely agree with that. I think of that um, one of the things that Shannon has talked about in, in some of the series is the is the self care and making sure that um, you know I think when consistently our emotions are high, being able to um, slow ourselves down is is almost impossible. But making sure that we're giving ourselves opportunities to bring those emotions down consistently versus having them build and build and build um, is really um, an important key factor to that daily self care that is going to be important for the resilience and for you to be able to take a step back. Shannon, do you have anything to add about um, about how to manage those big emotions in the moment? Yeah, I think you're you're right, Colleen, with going back to some of the material from session two, helping with self care and the section for managing emotions. I think some of those skills in there would be helpful in that situation. It also makes me think of like the red light, green lights that we talked about a lot. And it sounds like in some of these situations, since emotions are so high, it might be one of the red light situations where it would prob probably be advisable to um, stop the conversation or interaction and then pick up again when emotions aren't as high. Um, that being said, it can be really hard to do those things um, in real life. So I think the more that you practice it and have a plan in place that you can try to implement when it happens, like maybe a statement that you have prepared in advance for when you know your emotions are really high, that you can say to your child, you know, I'm really stressed out maybe, you know, about this conversation and I want to be able to give you my full attention and be able to problem solve with you. So I would, I think we should pick this back up in an hour or two and then maybe doing some of the self care things that um, help you with your stress. Um, that being said, I mean, it is a very hard thing, but I think the more you practice and the more strategies you use, the better it, it will be for you. 
Yeah, and I think, Shannon, the other thing I always try to remind myself is that none of us are good problem solvers whenever we're upset or angry. And so um, just recognizing that in yourself is as much as we want to solve the problem in the moment, when our emotions are high and our child's emotions are high, there really isn't any such thing as effective problem solving. So we really do need to recognize those red lights and take a break. Um, as a follow up, someone mentioned about, you know, what do you do if someone's walking out the door trying to drive away, I'm assuming with the consequence maybe being that they don't have access to the car, you know, what do you do, follow them, grab the keys, make a scene. Um, I think safety, again, is, you know, we have to make sure that we're not putting you or your child in danger. So pursuing them in a car or trying to physically remove the keys from them in the moment, I think we have to make sure, number one, that everybody is safe. If a child takes the car without your permission, um, you know, there are things that we could talk through and maybe you talk through in advance. The consequence for not coming home on time will be that you lose access to the car. If you take the car without permission, I will um, call the police, you know, that because that if they take in the car without permission, that will be the consequence. So that's something, again, that you have to think about in advance. Is that something that you're willing to do? If not, then that shouldn't be something that you mention. Um, so, you know, that's why sitting down and thinking through what are the consequences? How can I apply those consequences? Is it safe for me to do that? Um, and how can I think ahead so I can prevent so an unsafe situation from happening to me or my child. But those, yeah, you're absolutely right. In the moment, high emotions, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to make those decisions. Um, and so I think the big take home today is thinking ahead of what you have the ability to, what consequences you have the ability to follow through on and making sure that it's safe for both you and your child. And I will mention that um, these sessions um, are really meant to be introductory. They were really um, to, meant to get the information out to start people, you know, start the conversation about about parenting, um, thinking about all of the topics that Shannon and Callan um, talked about. But in no way do we believe that this information is um, is going to solve. Um, anyone's problems. I am sure that just like the questions that were um, put in the Q and A, people have lots and lots of more questions to be um, to be thinking about. And so that's one of the things that I'm most excited about that CCP has offered us the opportunity to provide ongoing parent support one on one, so we can get to know you and your circumstances, your values as a parent and a family, and how we can support you in coming up with some plans on how to really, um, you know provoke change in your child and your family. So if you feel like this wasn't enough, if you feel like you still have questions and that um, that maybe we weren't able to address those during these sessions, um, Shannon and I are both uh, more than happy to follow up with you uh, by if you share your information in the email that you'd like to get additional information about parent support, we can have this ongoing conversation and also have you try some things and then come back to us and reevaluate. Did it work? Didn't it work? What were the barriers? Um, what were the obstacles? And how can we reset and try again? Um, because this is an ongoing process. And no, not very many of us um, are going to get it right the first time. And we often have to tweak and retweak before we get something that's going to work for us and our, our child and our families. Yeah, I totally agree, Colleen. I, I wish as being someone, you know, putting this material together to try to help parents um, that I would be able to offer like a very simple solution or quick fix. But unfortunately, there's there's none that I know of out there. Um, so really, um, like Colleen said, trying the skills and refining them and working on them again and knowing that it can sometimes be a messy process, um, but just consistently hanging in there with your child and continuing to try your best is really um, the most important thing that you can do. I think we maybe got another question. Oh, okay, it was this, thank you. 
So with that, it's about 645. Shannon and I will continue to stay on until 7 o'clock. So even after the live event, please feel free to continue to ask questions. Um, we're happy to answer those. I want to thank everyone that participated today, especially to thank Shannon, who did a beautiful job in presenting not only today's presentation, but the previous three presentations as well. Um, I want to thank CCP for again offering us this opportunity to reach out to families and all of their CCP practices uh, to start the conversation about how to help uh, adolescents with substance use and I would encourage you to continue to reach out to our program if there's anything that we can do to support you or your adolescent moving forward. So we'll go ahead and sign off for today. Again, thank you for spending um, your Tuesday evening with us. I know it's been a pleasure for Shannon and I to be um, to do this with you today and we will stop the conversation, um, at least the live one, and um, well actually we won't stop yet. So it says, can you explain the Smart Choices program? I missed part of the class when you likely went over. Um, so yeah, we'd be we'd be happy to talk to you a little bit about that. Shannon, do you want to start and then I can add? Sure, yeah, so we have um, a care coordinator in the program um, who's actually Callan, who if you were at previous sessions, you might be familiar with her. And her focus is to work with the adolescents to help them come up with some goals on how to cut back or stop their substance use, or if they're not willing to do those things, maybe reduce some harm related to their substance use. And then at the same time, we have a uh, family support partner named Michelle who works with the parents um, to really give them support and um, be there for them to work through a lot of these skills that we talked about. So um, specifically going through a lot of the skills from the 20 minute guide um, and being there to um, you support either over the, over the phone or we've been doing a lot of video appointments now that things are going um, more in that direction with COVID. So um, yeah, we have parent support, which I think is is great and really unique because it's sometimes it's hard to find parent support and then also support for the adolescent. Yeah, and I think the important thing for about smart choices is it's not treatment. And so sometimes we have kids that fall into this gray area where um, you know, they don't need substance use treatment, um, and, but parents are concerned and they're not sure what to do. And so this is really an enhanced service that CCPs offers at no charge to families. We don't bill insurance. There is no, um, you know, there's no uh, fee associated with it. It can be a one-time um, session with a parent uh, that just giving some additional support or advice. It can be um, weekly. It can be like Shannon said on the phone or through video or in person if you'd like um, and even if your adolescent isn't ready to talk about change then um, a parent can still access this support which I think is unique historically um, typically parents only get support at, if a child has engaged in substance use treatment or behavioral health treatment um, but I think the nice thing about Smart Choices is as a parent, if you're recognizing that this is something you want to learn more about, regardless of where your child is on the change process or whether they're willing to engage, engage in this um, type of activity, um, you can as a parent learn and grow and problem solve. And I really see it more as a coaching um, model than a treatment model. So if you'd like more information about Smart Choices, certainly we have uh, information we can share um, they hopefully will have those at the CCP offices, but we can certainly send out a flyer about that program when we follow up with you after the program and anyone can reach out for additional information using the email that they registered. So thank you for asking that question. So we'll go ahead and log out. It's about 6.48. Uh, Shannon and I will continue to stay on and the Q&A will be open until 7. Uh, and again, thank you so much and I hope everyone has a good evening.